They've just released the 2023 AP Calc AB free response questions, so I'm going to show you how to solve all six of them. The first two require the use of a graphing calculator, and the last four questions forbid it. In the description, I'll leave timestamps so you can skip around the video as you please, as well as a link to download this PDF with my full written solutions. It's on my Patreon page, it's free, but I hope you'll consider supporting the channel on Patreon if you find my videos helpful after downloading the free PDF. Yeah. Let's get into it. I've already written out all of my solutions. I'll just walk you through them. Here's our first question. A customer at a gas station is pumping gasoline into a gas tank. The rate of flow of gasoline is modeled by differentiable function, means it's also continuous, F, where F of T is measured in gallons per second, and T, of course, is measured in seconds since the pumping began. Uh, and we also have selected values of the function here in the table. So the first part, a, using correct units, we want to interpret the meaning of the integral of f of t dt from 60 to 135 in the context of this problem. And that's pretty easy. An integral accumulates rates of change. So if f of t is the gallons per second, we're pumping gasoline into a gas tank, and f of t is the gallons per second of that rate of flow, then when we integrate that rate of flow, when we integrate f of t, we will just get the amount of gas that flowed into the gas tank. So this integral from 60 to 135, f of t dt, is the number of gallons that flow into the gas tank from t equals 60 to t equals 135. The integral accumulates the rates of flow, and in total, it just gives us how much gas flowed into the tank over that time interval. Next, we're asked to use a right Riemann sum with these three subintervals to approximate the value of the integral we previously discussed. So this means we're going to have three rectangles because we've got these three intervals. And since we're using a right Riemann sum, the height of each rectangle will be determined by the function's value at the right endpoints of these intervals. Those will be the heights of the rectangles, and then the base lengths of the rectangles will just be the lengths of these intervals, so 30, 30, and 15. And we can see that approximation here in blue. The first rectangle in the interval from 60 to 90 has a base of 30, and we multiply by its height, which is the function's value at that right endpoint of 90. The function's value at 90 we see in the table is 0.15. Then we have to add the rectangle over the next interval from 90 to 120. The base has a length of 30, and then the height of the rectangle is the function's value at the right endpoint. Again, the table gives that as 0.1. Finally, the last interval has a length of 15, so that's the base of the rectangle, and then the height of the rectangle is the function's value at the right endpoint. Again, and we're using the right endpoints because we're asked to use a right Riemann sum. Now, f of 135, the table gives as 0 0.05. So we set all this up. It's equal to this once we plug those numbers in, and the calculator tells us this is about 8.25 gallons. So about 8.25 gallons flowed into the gas tank from t equals 60 to t equals 135. Part B, must there exist a value of c for c between 60 and 120, such that f prime of c is equal to zero. And of course, we must justify our answer. Since this is a question about guaranteeing that the derivative takes a certain value in a certain interval, you should be thinking about using the mean value theorem, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Since we were given that our function f was differentiable, we also know it is continuous. And so the mean value theorem will apply on this interval that we're interested in from 60 to 120. The mean value theorem tells us that over this interval where the function is differentiable and continuous, the function's average rate of change is also taken on by the derivative at some point. 
Now the function's average rate of change over the interval is just the change in the function's value from the beginning to end, so f of 120 minus f of 60, divided by the interval's length, which is 120 minus 60. Now if we consult the table, f of 120 is 0.1, f of 60 is 0.1, so when we subtract those, we're going to get 0. The denominator, of course, is 60, but 0 over 60 is just 0. This means the function's average rate of change over this interval was 0. So the mean value theorem guarantees there will be a point in this interval where the derivative of the function, the instantaneous rate of change, is equal to that average rate of change. So we can conclude there exists c in this interval from 60 to 120 by the mean value theorem, so that the instantaneous rate of change equals this average rate of change. So the answer is yes, there is such a value, and that's why. It's a result of the mean value theorem. Here's part C. The rate of flow of gasoline in gallons per second can also be modeled by this function g of t, t over 500 times cosine of t over 120 squared, for t between 0 and 150. Using this model, we're asked to find the average rate of flow of gasoline over the time interval from 0 to 150, and we need to show the setup for our calculations, which we'll do in a calculator, we just need to make sure that we write the setup. The setup is simple, you just need to know how to calculate the average rate of flow. If to find the average, we just have to add up the rates of flow, which means an integral. We add up g of t, so this is just g of t, and we're adding it up, we're integrating it over the interval from 0 to 150, and then we want the average. So you just have to divide by the length of the interval. That's dividing by 150 over here, though I've written it as a multiplication by 1 over 150. It's, of course, the same thing. If you put this into a calculator, you get about 0 0.096 gallons per second. That's about the average rate of flow of gasoline over this time interval. Explaining it once more, to find the average value of a function over an interval, you must integrate the function on that interval and then divide by the interval's length. In this case, we want to find the average rate of flow, and the function we have is the rate of flow. So we integrate it over the interval and divide by the interval's length. Part D asks us to use the model G defined in part C to find the value of G prime of 140 and to interpret the meaning of our answer in context of the problem. Now remember, G is already kind of like a derivative. We often think of the derivative as the rate of change. G is a rate of change. It's the rate of flow of gas into the gas tank. So when we take the derivative of this, it's kind of like acceleration. It's the rate of change of the rate of change the rate of change of the flow of the gas. So anyways, a calculator can calculate this number easily. It will give us the numerical value of the derivative of g when t is equal to 140. So if we ask the calculator to take the derivative of this function at t equals 140, we get about negative 0 0.0049 gallons per second per second. Again, this is giving us information about the rate of change of the rate of the flow of the gasoline. So what we can say is that the rate of flow of gasoline is decreasing because it's a negative derivative. It's decreasing at a rate of 0 0.0049 gallons per second per second. Notice that I don't write the negative here because I said it's decreasing. The fact that we've said the rate of flow is decreasing accounts for this negative, so I shouldn't actually put it here with that number. This means that at t equals 140, for each second that passes, the rate of flow of gasoline becomes about 0 0.0049 gallons per second slower. Question two, again, this is a calculator question. Steven swims back and forth along a straight path in a 50 meter long pool for 90 seconds. Steven's velocity is modeled by v of t equals 2.38 e to the negative 0.02 t times sine of pi over 56 t, where t is measured in seconds and v of t is measured in meters per second. Part A is to find all times t in the interval uh, where t is between 0 and 90, at which Stephen changes direction. And of course, we want to give a reason for our answer. Now, Stephen changing direction is going to be marked by the velocity going from positive 
to negative. The question, of course, gives us the velocity, so we just have to graph it and see where it goes from positive to negative in the interval from 0 to 90. If we graph the function, it looks something like this, what I've got here on the right, and we can see that it passes 0 at x equals 56. Here the velocity goes from positive to negative, and we see that at x equals 112, it hits 0 again, but that's outside of the interval. The interval is from 0 to 90. So on that interval, the only value where he changes direction is at 56. So what time in the interval does he change direction? t equals 56, because it's there that the velocity function changes from positive to negative. Remember, for velocity, positive and negative tell us the direction. So that's where the direction changes. Part b. Find Stevens' acceleration, derivative of the velocity, at time t equals 60 seconds. Show the setup for your calculations and indicate units of measure. We're also asked, is Stevens speeding up or slowing down at time t equals 60 seconds? And to give a reason for our answer. So we need to look at the acceleration at t equals 60. Thus, we'll take the derivative of the velocity function, just plug it into a calculator. Calculator can give us the value of the derivative at a point. And the calculator gives this as negative 0.036 meters per second second squared. Of course, the calculator doesn't actually tell you the units, you just have to know if the velocity is meters per second, the acceleration is meters per second per second, or meters per second squared. All right, and then we're asked, is Steven speeding up or slowing down? You might be tempted to say he's slowing down because the acceleration is negative, but that depends on what the velocity is. If the velocity is positive, then indeed a negative acceleration indicates that the velocity is getting closer to zero. It's getting smaller. He's slowing down. However, if the velocity is negative, and the acceleration is negative, that means the velocity is getting further away from zero. It's getting more extreme. He's actually speeding up just in the negative direction. So acceleration here is negative, but so is the velocity. Thus, Steven is speeding up. And we know that V of 60 is negative pretty much because of part A. The only time Steven changed direction was at T equals 56, where V of T changed from positive to negative and it didn't change again on this interval. So at t equals 60, the velocity is still negative, and thus the acceleration being negative tells us that he is speeding up. Part C asks us to find the distance between Steven's position at time t equals 20 seconds and his position at time t equals 80 seconds, and to show the setup for our calculation. To find the displacement, that's what this is, it's the distance between his position at one time and another time, all you have to do is integrate velocity. The velocity will have some positives and negatives that will cancel each other out in a way that we want, so we're just left with the total change in position, the displacement. So we integrate the velocity from 20 to 80. If we put that in a calculator, which can give you integrals, we get it's about 23.384 meters. That's about the distance between Stevens' position at time t equals 20 and t equals 80. On the other hand, in part D, we're asked to find the total distance Steven swims over the time interval between 0 and 90, and again to show the setup. So here you don't want the positive and negative velocities to cancel each other out at all, because we're not interested in the displacement, we're actually interested in just how far did Steven swim. So we want all the velocities to be considered as positive. He's always swimming, so we want to integrate the absolute value of the the velocity function. Thus, we're integrating speed here. We're integrating it from 0 to 90 because that's the interval it asks for. And if you put this in a calculator, that makes the absolute value obviously a lot easier to deal with when you put it in a calculator. You're going to get about 62.164 meters. So that's about how far Steven swam. And as we would expect, it's bigger than the number we got in part C because that number was just the change in his position. We're now on to the no calculator section, beginning with question three concerning milk. A bottle of milk is taken out of a refrigerator and placed in a pan of hot water to be warmed. The increasing function, m, models the temperature of the milk at time t, where m of t is measured in degrees Celsius, and t is the number of minutes since the bottle was placed in the pan. 
m satisfies the differential equation dm dt equals a fourth times 40 minus m. At time t equals zero, the temperature of the milk is five degrees Celsius. Also, it can be shown that m of t is less than 40 for all values of t. Part A gives us a slope field for the differential equation, and we are asked to sketch the solution curve through the point 0, 05. The point 0, 05 is marked on the slope field, so we just have to, starting at that point, sketch a curve that follows the directions indicated by the slope field, something like that. Part B asks us to use the line tangent to the graph of m at t equals 0 to approximate the value of m at t equals 2. That's the temperature of the milk at time t equals 2. So we just need to find the equation of the line tangent to m at t equals 0 and then plug 2 into that tangent line. To find the tangent line, of course, we're going to need the slope of m at t equals 0. So considering our differential equation, we can just plug t equals 0 in. Now, t isn't actually part of the differential equation. If you remember, it's 1 fourth times 40 minus m. However, we know that at t equals 0, m is 5 degrees Celsius. That's given to us here. So when t equals 0, we'll just plug m equals 5 into the differential equation, and that's going to give us the slope of m at t equals zero. So this is gonna be the slope of our tangent line at t equals zero. So here is the equation of the tangent line in point slope form. The y coordinate, which in this case, I'm just using m star rather than m because this is just the tangent line. It's not actually m, the temperature of the milk. It's just the tangent line at a point. So I'm just using m star to indicate that. So it's the y value, m star in this case, minus the y coordinate, so in this case, that's 5, the temperature at t equals 0. And that's equal to the slope, which we just figured out, multiplied by the x, or in this case, t, that's our independent variable, time, minus the x-coordinate, or the time-coordinate, in this case, is 0, because this is the tangent at t equals 0. Now, we want to use this tangent at t equals 0 to approximate the value of m at t equals 2. So all we do is plug t equals 2 into this tangent line and solve for m star. That's going to give us an approximation. Now, if we plug 2 in, we get just 2 times 35 over 4. And if we add 5 to both sides, we get an approximation of about 45 over 2 degrees Celsius. That's because 35 over 4 times 2 is just 35 over 2. But when we add 5 to both sides, that's 35 over 2 plus 10 over 2, so 45 over 2. And that's our approximation for the temperature of the milk at time t equals 2 minutes. In part c, we're asked to write an expression for the second derivative of m with respect to time in terms of m, and then to use this second derivative, which is concavity, to determine whether the approximation that we just got in part b is an underestimate or an overestimate of the actual value at time t equals 2. And of course, we want to give a reason for our answer. So we already know what dm dt is, so to find the second derivative, we just need to take the derivative of the first derivative. The first derivative, as provided by the question, remember, was dm dt equals 1 fourth 40 minus m. So when we take the second derivative of that with respect to time, we're just going to get 1 fourth times the derivative of negative m, which is just negative dm dt. DM dt, though, we know what that is. DM dt is 1 fourth times 40 minus m. So we can replace DM dt with what it is, because the question tells us what it is. So finally, we have 1 fourth, but let's pull that negative in front, so it's negative 1 fourth, times DM dt, which is 1 fourth times 40 minus m. Then we can also just move this negative into the parentheses, so 40 minus m becomes m minus 40, and then a fourth times a fourth is just a sixteenth. So finally, the second derivative is 1 sixteenth times m minus 40. 
40. Now, we were asked about our approximation using a tangent line at t equals 0, and as we discussed, when t equals 0, m is equal to 5. That was provided by the question. So we need to plug m equals 5 into this second derivative. We find that when m equals 5, the second derivative is negative, because 5 minus 40 is negative 35. So that means the function m is concave down at t equals 0. It would look something like this. We've got a concave down function, and you can see how our tangent line at t equals 0 would be an overestimate. These three dots, by the way, mean therefore. m is concave down, therefore we had an overestimate. Part D asks us to use separation of variables to find an expression for m of t. The particular solution to the differential equation dm dt equals a fourth times 40 minus m. And since we need a particular solution, we of course need an initial condition, which was given as m of 0 equals 5. So let's use separation of variables to solve this. We'll want to move the 40 minus m over to the left side to be with the dm, and then we'll move the dt over to the right side and integrate. Here is that process. This is the differential equation given. We divide both sides by 40 minus m to move that over here, multiply both sides by dt, and then we integrate. That gets us to this equation. The integral of dm over 40 minus m equals the integral of a fourth dt. The integral of 40 minus m is the natural log of the absolute value of 40 minus m multiplied by a negative in front because you would have to undo the multiplication by a negative that's coming from that negative m. On the right side, we're integrating with respect to t, so we get a fourth t, and we'll just add on the arbitrary constant over there. Then we can multiply both sides by a negative to get rid of that negative in front of the natural log. That makes the one-fourth t become negative one-fourth t. It turns the arbitrary constant c just into some other arbitrary constant. We'll just keep calling it c. And then to undo the natural log, we put everything in a power of e. So now what we have is e to the natural log of the absolute value 40 minus m. And on the right side, we have e to the negative 1 4th t plus c. The e and the natural log undo each other giving us absolute value of 40 minus m. On the right, we still have e to the negative 1 4th t plus c. If you recall, one of the details the question originally gave us was that m of t is less than 40. That means 40 minus m is always going to be positive, and we can drop the absolute value bars. So we have that 40 minus m is equal to e to the negative 4th t plus c. But of course, e to the negative 4th t plus c by our exponent laws, we could rewrite as e to the negative one-fourth t times e to the c. But e to the c is just some other constant. So let's just call that c and bring that in front of the exponential. So now what we have is c, that arbitrary constant, multiplied by e to the negative one-fourth t. The initial condition was that at time t equals 0, m is equal to 5. So plugging those things in, we have that 40 minus 5 is equal to c times e to the negative 1 fourth times 0. Negative 1 fourth times 0 is 0, and e to the 0 is 1, so this is just 35 equals c, and we get our arbitrary constant. Now we can plug that into our general solution in order to get the particular solution. We would simply add m to both sides, then subtract the exponential over, so we would have m equals 40 minus c, which we figured out was 35, multiplied by e to the negative one-fourth here is question 4. The function f is defined on the closed interval from negative 2 to 8 and satisfies f of 2 equals 1. The graph of f prime, the derivative of f, consists of two line segments and a semicircle as shown in the figure. Part a asks, does f have a relative minimum, relative maximum, or neither at x equals 6? And we want to give a reason for our answer. So we want to think about looking at the graph of the derivative at x equals 6. We see the derivative there is 0. So does the function have a relative min or a relative max, or does it have neither? 
The answer is neither. Although f prime of 6 is 0, the derivative is 0 there, the derivative doesn't switch signs. You see how it stays positive. So it's positive before and after x equals 6. That means it's not a relative min or a relative max. The function could look something like this. It flattens out when the derivative is 0, but before and after that, it's still increasing. So there is no relative min or max. To have a relative min or max, we need the derivative to cross zero, to switch signs. Like you see at x equals two, the derivative goes from negative to positive. That means the function went from decreasing to increasing, and you would have a relative minimum there. On to part b. On what open intervals, if any, is the graph of f concave down? And we want to give a reason for our answer. A graph is concave down when the second derivative is negative. That means it's concave down where the derivative is decreasing because the second derivative is negative. So where is the derivative decreasing? It's decreasing from negative two to zero and from four to six. So since our function f is concave down where f prime is decreasing, that is on the interval from negative two to zero union with the interval from four to six. We can see that from the graph. So that is the answer to part b. Part c asks us to find the value of this limit or show that it doesn't exist and to justify our answer. So the first thing we should try is plugging two into this limit and see what it looks like. The question tells us f of 2 is equal to 1, so if we plug 2 into this limit, what we're going to get is 6 times f of 2, which is just 6 times 1, minus 3 times 2, which is minus 6, so the numerator is just 6 minus 6, which is 0, and in the denominator, we have 2 squared, which is 4, minus 5 times 2, that's 10, so 4 minus 10, which is minus 6, plus 6, which is 0. All right, so it's 0 over 0. It's in an indeterminate form. That's good news, because that means we can use L'Hopital's rule. By L'Hopital's rule, the indeterminate limit that we're trying to evaluate must be equal to the limit of the ratio of the derivatives of the numerator and denominator. The derivative of 6f of x minus 3x is just 6f prime of x minus 3. And the derivative of the denominator, using the power rule, is just 2x minus 5. Then we can plug in 2. f prime of 2, if we come look at the graph of f prime, we can see that f prime at x equals 2 is 0. So this is going to be 6 times 0 minus 3, which is just negative 3. And in the denominator, we have 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 5. So negative 3 divided by 4 minus 5 is negative 1. The value of the limit is equal to 3. Part D asks us to find the absolute minimum value of our function f on the closed interval from negative 2 to 8 and to justify our answer. Now, the absolute minimum has to occur at either a relative minimum or at the endpoints, negative 2 or 8. So we just have to check those. We can see from the graph that the only relative minimum on this interval is at x equals 2, as we previously discussed. That's the only point where the derivative goes from decreasing to increasing. So that looks like this. That's the only relative minimum here. And remember, the question tells us the value of the function there is 1. So we have a relative minimum of 1 there. I'll just jot that down here, that f of 2 is equal to 1. As for the endpoints, first we can check the left endpoint, x equals negative 2. We're actually able to figure out the value of the function at this point by taking the value of 1, because we know that's what the function's value is at 2. And then we just need to integrate it from 2 backwards to negative 2. So that's going to give us the value of the function at negative 2. Take the value of the function at 2 and then integrate it backwards from 2 to negative 2. If you just use some geometry, we're going to have to take that value of 1 at x equals 2 and then when we add the integral, that's going to be adding the areas of these two triangles. So we've got that triangle there, and then we have this triangle here. The base of this blue triangle will be negative 3, because we're moving backwards, and its height will be negative 2. The base of the green triangle will be negative 1, because we're moving backwards, and its height will be 2. 
So the value of the function at x equals negative 2 is going to be 1, the value of the function at 2, plus this integral that takes us from 2 back to negative 2. So that's the area of the blue triangle we saw above, 1 half base of negative 3 times height of negative 2, plus the area of the green triangle we saw above, 1 half base, which was negative 1, times height, which was positive 2. And if you add this up, you get positive 3. So we see this can't be the absolute minimum, since 3 is bigger than the relative minimum's value of 1. Such a complicated method isn't even necessary to check the right endpoint of x equals 8. We can see from the graph of the derivative that the function is increasing from 6 to 8. So certainly, you know, if it's going to be looking something like this, at 8 we definitely do not have a minimum because the function is increasing to get to that point. So since the derivative is positive on the interval from 6 to 8, there cannot possibly be a minimum at x equals 8. And so we've checked all possible candidates. There must be an absolute minimum of 1 at x equals 2. That relative minimum turns out to be the absolute minimum on the closed interval from 2 to 8. We check the endpoints. Those aren't absolute minimums, so it must be that one. Also, we know that there must be an absolute minimum because the function is differentiable on this interval, which also means it's continuous. And so the extreme value theorem applies. There must be an absolute minimum. Again, we checked all the candidates, and so we see that it has to be an absolute minimum of 1 at x equals 2. Question 5. The functions f and g are twice differentiable. The table shown gives values of the functions and their first derivatives at selected values of x. Part a says let h be the function defined by h of x equals f of g of x, a nice composite function. We're asked to find h prime of 7 and to show the work that leads to our answer. So we're just going to have to use the chain rule. What is h prime of 7? Well, we've got to take the derivative of f of g of x. So by the chain rule, that's going to be f prime of g of 7 times g prime of 7. Derivative of the outside function times derivative of the inside function. And consulting the table, we see that this is 3 halves times 8, which is 12. That's because g of 7 we see in the table is 0, and that's getting plugged into f prime. f prime of 0 is 3 halves, and then we're multiplying that by g prime of 7, which we see is 8. So part A, the answer is 12. Letter B, let k be a differentiable function such that k prime of x equals f of x squared times g of x. We're asked, is the graph of k concave up or concave down at the point where x equals 4? Notice that we're given the derivative of k, so to see if it's concave up or concave down, we'll just have to take the derivative of the given derivative, that's the second derivative, and then the sign of that will tell us if it's concave up or down. To find the second derivative, taking the derivative of k prime, we need the product rule as well as the chain rule. The function on the left is f of x squared, so we're taking the derivative of that first, which is 2f of x times f prime of x, and then we need to multiply that by g of x, because it's really the product rule we're using here. If we were to call f of x squared u, and then maybe we call g of x v, the product rule is telling us that, let me write it in gray, tells us that u prime v plus u v prime is the derivative of this function. So that's what we're doing here. The u prime is 2 f of x times f prime of x, and then v v is just g of x. Then we have to add u v prime, or v prime u in the way that I've written it here. v prime is just g prime, and then u, of course, is f of x squared, which you see there. Let me just mention again, the derivative of f of x squared is 2 f of x f prime of x because of the chain rule. The outside function is a thing squared, so the derivative of that is just 2 f of x, but then you got to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, so that's going to be f prime. Now that we have the second derivative, remember we're asked is the function k concave up or concave down at x equals 4? We've got the second derivative, so just plug 4 into it. So we have 2 times f of 4, which is given in the table as 4. And then that's getting multiplied by f prime of 4, which is given in the table as 3. And then that's getting multiplied by g of 4, given in the table as negative 3. So we get all that. 
plus g prime of 4, which is given as 2, multiplied by f of 4 squared. f of 4 is 4, so we square that and get 16. This all adds up to negative 40, which is less than 0. Since the second derivative, at x equals 4, is less than 0, k must be concave down at x equals 4. Part C says, let m be the function defined by m of x equals 5x cubed plus the integral from 0 to x of f prime of t dt. We're asked to find m of 2 and to show our work. So to find m of 2, well, we're just going to have to plug 2 into the function, right? It defines m for us, so let's just plug 2 into it. 5 times 2 cubed is 5 times 8. Then we need to add this to the integral of f prime of t dt from 0 to 2. Now 5 times 8 is just 40. The integral of f prime from 0 to 2 is just f of 2 minus f of 0. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus at work. f of 2 and f of 0 were given to us in the table. f of 2 is 7 and f of 0 is 10. So 7 minus 10 is negative 3. 40 plus negative 3 gets us to 37. And so m of 2 is 37. The only tricky thing here really was the integral of the derivative from 0 to 2. If you're integrating the derivative of a function from 0 to 2, that's just the original function, because the integral and derivative kind of cancel out. It's the original function evaluated at 2 minus the original function evaluated at 0. Part D asks, is the function m defined in part c increasing, decreasing, or neither at x equals 2? And we want to justify our answer. To see if a function is increasing or decreasing, we need to take the derivative. So we're going to ask, what's m prime of x? Well, the derivative of 5x cubed is just 15x squared. When we take the derivative of this integral part, the derivative and the integral cancel each other out, and so we're just left with the inside of the integral, which happens to be f prime of x. Then we plug 2 into this. 15 times 2 squared is 15 times 4, which is 60, and f prime of 2 is given in the table as 8. 60 minus 8 is positive, so since the derivative of m at x equals 2 is positive, m is increasing at x equals 2. Finally, question 6. Consider the curve given by the equation 6xy equals 2 plus y cubed. Part A asks us to show that dy dx is equal to 2y over y squared minus 2x. So we're going to have to use implicit differentiation here. We begin with the equation 6xy equals 2 plus y cubed, then take the derivative of the left side and the right side. On the left side, we need to use a product rule because we have 6x times y. The product rule is f prime g plus g prime f. F prime is 6, and G is Y. G prime is dy dx, and F is 6x. So this is the derivative of the left side. On the right side, the derivative of 2 is 0, and the derivative of Y cubed with respect to X is 3Y squared times dy dx. Now, subtracting 6x times dy dx from both sides, and then factoring the dy dx out, we get that 6y is equal to dy dx times 3y squared minus 6x. Dividing both sides by 3y squared minus 6x and canceling out a factor of 3 from everything, we find that dy dx is equal to 2y divided by y squared minus 2x as desired. Again, this thing on the right is just 6y divided by 3y squared minus 6x, but we canceled out a common factor of 3. And so that's how we demonstrate part A. Part B says, find the coordinates of a point on the curve at which the line tangent to the curve is horizontal or explain why no such point exists. The line tangent to the curve will be horizontal where the derivative, dy dx, is equal to zero. Now, if this is equal to zero, the numerator, 2y, must equal zero, which forces y to equal zero. So that means we're going to need y to equal zero. That's what's going to make the tangent horizontal. So we can take y equals 0 and plug it into the original equation so that we can find x and find the point on the curve where this happens. If we plug y equals 0 into this original equation, then we get 0 on the left side equals 2 plus y cubed. 
but that's impossible when y is equal to zero because that would just be zero equals two. So there is no such point on the curve where the tangent is horizontal. Part C is similar. It asks us to find the coordinates of a point on the curve at which the line tangent to the curve is vertical or explain why no such point exists. For the tangent line to be vertical, we effectively need its slope to be infinite, which means we need the denominator to be zero and the numerator to be non-zero. If we take the denominator, y squared minus 2x and set it equal to zero, that means that x is equal to one half y squared, just adding 2x to both sides and dividing by two. If x is equal to one half y squared, well, we can plug that into the original equation. We'll have six times one half y squared times y, equals two plus y cubed. And that's what we see down here. Six times one half gives us this three. So we have three y squared y equals two plus y cubed. Thus, subtracting a y cubed from both sides, we have three y cubed on the left, subtract that y cubed from the right, that's two y cubes on the left now, and that's equal to two on the right. Solving this equation for y gives us y equals one. Remember, we already know that x is one half y squared. So if y is one, x must equal one half. We can also check that the numerator would be non-zero. The numerator is two y and y is equal to one. So the numerator is non-zero. We see there is a point where dy dx is equal to zero. So we will have a vertical tangent at this point where x is one half and y is one. Finally, part D, a particle is moving along the curve. At the instant when the particle is at the point one half negative two, its horizontal position is increasing at a rate of two thirds of a unit per second. That's dx dt. We're asked to find the value of dy dt, the rate of change of the vertical position at this instant. So we'll take our original equation that it gave us and just replace x and y with x of t and y of t, just recognizing that the horizontal position and vertical positions are functions of time. Then we can take the derivative of the left and right sides with respect to time. We will again need to use the product rule. On the left, we'll have f prime g, so that's gonna be six x prime of t times y of t, and then we'll add g prime f g prime is y prime of t, and f is 6x of t. On the right side, the derivative of 2 is 0, and then we take the derivative of y of t cubed. That's going to be 3y of t squared times y prime of t. This is a lot like the original implicit differentiation that we did. Now remember, we're trying to find dy dt, which is y prime of t. Everything else we can just plug in at this point and then solve for y prime of t. Starting here on the left, we have six times x prime times y. x prime, dx dt, was given to us as two thirds. So six times two thirds, that's two times two, which is four. And we need to multiply that by y, which at this instant is negative two. And that's how we get four times negative two. We then have to add y prime, which we're looking for, so we can't plug anything in for that, multiplied by six x of t. Again, x of t was given to us as one half. So six times x of t is gonna be six times a half, which is three. On the right side of the equation, we have three times y of t squared times y prime. Again, y prime is gonna stay there, but y is given to us as negative two. So y squared is negative two squared, which is four multiplied by three is 12. So finally, we have four times negative two, which is negative eight, plus y prime times three, which is three y prime. We can subtract that to the other side, 12 y prime minus three y prime. That gives us nine y prime on the right. Well, we have negative eight on the left. Solving for y prime, we find that y prime of t, which is dy dt, equals negative eight ninths units per second. And I'll just write that over here to be extra clear. This is the same thing as dy dt, negative eight ninths units per second. And those are my solutions to the 2023 AP Calc AB free response questions. Link in the description to my video solutions of the BC free response questions. Again, there's a link in the description to download this PDF of my solutions for free. It's on my Patreon page. If you find my lessons helpful, I hope you'll consider supporting the channel on Patreon. It's a big help.
You can also check out my Calculus One course and my Calculus One exercises playlists. Those are in the description too. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much for watching.